everyone. I'm Justine Frolker. I'm live on my personal page and my public author speaker page. And um, I have been somewhat avoiding this topic, I suppose, even though it was the most requested topic that I had when I shared that I was going to be talking about grief for a few weeks. So number one, my what if it's grief topic um, had to take a hiatus because, well, July nearly killed me. Um, just lots of struggle, lots of darkness, mostly with people that I love very, very, very much, which also means that it there's a lot on me. And so I think a lot of people had not so awesome Julys. And here we are in August. And just to warn you, um, there are still now, there are now six planets in retrograde, whether like, I don't care. That stuff has energy. It means something, but I am choosing again, like I said last time, curiosity and excitement. I'm going to look to myself and receive whatever lessons I am needing to receive and kind of whatever. I am listening. Okay. But so when I talked about my grief series that I had coming out, the number one topic I had, um, was the grief that comes when most especially it's complicated. I argue that almost all grief is complicated. It came with this huge request to talk about the grief, especially when it's with someone that's still alive, um, especially when it's probably family, right? Like, um, because not all of our families are good for us or all relationships that we want to have in our lives are good for us. And so we ha they change and we have to grieve them. And like, one of my phones is reconnecting. I don't know why it did that. So there's, we are literally less than a mile from the PGA and my phone, I've had no, uh, cell service. I don't, is that data? I never know. Whatever. All day. I think it has to do with the PGA and the dogs will probably bark because, well, it's the PGA and we're like right next to it. But anyways, so there, there's my disclaimer for my super professional film studio. At least I have lights, although I forgot to turn on one of them. I just realized anyways. Good Lord, butterfly. So this grief that comes when like, when we realize that a relationship needs to change or that we are grieving a relationship of someone that's still alive. And again, it happens a lot with family. I, this for me falls underneath the term complicated grief. And I am one to argue that most all grief is complicated. Just like all grief is lifelong because it's a loss of something and you will have to go the rest of your life as that loss changes and morphs. And as we talk about in the Rising Strong curriculum, the more you don't talk about that loss, the bigger the hole grows. And I have people ask me all of the time, does it ever get better? It doesn't, it gets different. That's coming from someone who will have grief the rest of her life, wondering who her three would be. And I argue with you that this might be, this just falls underneath complicated grief. It's the messy of grief. But like, I wrote down this list because I was like, I've been avoiding this topic because I know how important it is to so many of you. And you want this quick fix. And there isn't a quick fix. I can give you some of the language and the teachings and some new ways to think about it. But there's not a quick fix for complicated grief. Grief is complicated. But complicated grief. So you can also call it things like um, disenfranchised grief or um, ambiguous grief. It's grief that in many ways society does not recognize. Um, so the easiest, easiest example for me to use obviously is my own grief. Um, my surrogate never achieved a pregnancy. I never got to hold a child. Um, I get for the rest of my days a black and white picture that continues to fade of three globs of eight cells. To many people, they don't count. To many people, 
I have nothing to grieve because they were never here. To me, they are my children and they count too. And so a lot of the times people will quickly judge my grief of saying like, well, you must have not wanted to be a mom very bad if you didn't try again or if you're not adopting. Um, they judge my grief. It's disenfranchised. It's ambiguous. And so it's it's just like not considered by society. And so this further complicates grief because at the end of the day, we all long and yearn to feel seen and known and loved especially when we're in pain, especially when we are in grief. But this complicated grief, like this list I came up with, like it's also like this loss of something you can't see. It doesn't have to necessarily be a death of a person or a pet. It could be the loss of a dream. It could be the loss of how you thought things were going to be. It's that part of grief that's so, it's complicated, it's nuanced, it's difficult to understand. And when we look at the grief research, many people call it ambiguous or disenfranchised. But then, of course, there is that loss of someone who is not necessarily gone. When I thought about this, because I got so many messages on it, how do you grieve someone that is still here but you know cannot be in your life? Um, if you followed any of my work for any amount of time, you know that I love boundaries. Um, We're really good at making ourselves feel like shit. We don't really need people in our lives to do it for us, even if they're family. I would say, especially if they're family. And so you will go through life as you change and grow, as the people in your life change and grow, knowing that you must let some relationships go. And that comes with grief and you might even still have to see them you might even still have to see them with boundaries how do you grieve someone who's still here how do you grieve that loss and I would argue to say you're grieving the person but you're grieving the way it was supposed to be that's what you're truly grieving and like when I was also thinking about this and praying on it, like for me, like there's also this piece like of grief when it comes to this complicated, messy grief of like how much because that relationship has changed or that person has changed or hurt you or betrayed you or you've changed and grown. And so the relationship has changed. There's also grief for your old self. Like when we go through struggle and hard times, we can never unknow what we know now. And so in a lot of ways, you also have to grieve your old self, your old life, those old relationships. That's just simply grief. And at the end of the day, the last the thing, this is my world vision. <laughs> it's the only piece of paper I can find. At the end of the day, the strongest lesson that I have learned is that because what I also came up with when I was just like taking my rest break outside before I went live was um, I also had to grieve this idea and I'm still working through it for sure. As I continue to make my life a gift and rise from the ashes of failed infertility treatments. I also had to grieve the God that I so badly wanted to blame. The God that took my three babies away. I had to grieve that blaming part. I had to grieve that I could be pissed at him and rather that I could turn towards, towards him and talk to him about it. Because it is a loving God who gifted me those three children because it's how I found him and it's how I found my best self and created my best self. So there's also like grief with God too. Like if you really think about it or whatever your higher power is, I don't care. The bottom line though is it's grief of our expectations. I expected IVF to work. That would have been fair. I paid for it. I'm a good person. Maybe I didn't pray enough, whatever. Like, because that's what my shame story will tell me. 
at the end of the day, we have to grieve what we expected out of life and out of others. What did you expect out of your mom, even though she can't give it to you? You must learn to love her with her limited ways. She has limitations. She cannot give something that she does not have to give. Fill in the blank. I don't care who it is. God, your mom, your sister, you, whatever. But like at the end of the day, the thing that we are grieving when it comes to complicated grief, especially, I would say even when it comes to a tragic death, which I have had lots in my life this last month, it's our expectations. It's our expectations that a 40-year-old mom of two is not supposed to drop dead. It's our expectations that parents are supposed to love us unconditionally and take care of us. It's our expectations that I should have been able to have kids. It is our expectations that we must grieve. And one of my favorite quotes, and it's not a, it's not a famous Brene quote because it's actually in the curriculum. You have to do the curriculum with me to get it. But like, like when we let go of our expectations instead of demanding that people meet them, that's a huge task. And what that's really about is grief. I must forgive people who have hurt me. I must forgive people that don't meet my expectations. And most of all, I must forgive myself for setting my expectations onto someone else who does not have it to give. Stop going to an empty well looking for water. Quite possibly one of my most popular sentence paragraphs in my first book stop going to an empty well looking for water sometimes people just don't have it to give and you must be willing to grieve what that comes with you must be willing to grieve loss of relationships loss of your old self loss of perhaps the idea of who you want to blame you must grieve and you've got, it's something that has to die. You have to bury it because that's the only way new can grow. And most of all, what has to die is our expectations. For me, this part of my story, I did a tapping meditation last week that was so powerful. Actually, I will link it below. It's so long. I mean, I still can't believe I sat down for 90 minutes and did it. And it was so mind-blowing for me. I am working through a huge block with my coach. Shout out to Cassandra at Life Worth. Like, I'm working through the biggest block of my entire life. And I came to that piece of, like, I finally figured out of where it came from. No one shows up for me. I have to do this all by myself. I'm invisible. And it was well before infertility treatments. And infertility treatments and life without my own kids has only exacerbated that lie in my head, that story that I've been living most of my life. And at the end of the day, what really has to die is my expectations because everybody has done their best. Everyone. And I have to stop looking for something from someone when they don't have it to give. And so I will bury my expectations and I will love people where they are, limitations and all. And I will live with radical forgiveness in my life into love because that's how I want to walk this earth. And I had a perfect example for me before me in Jesus. So the thing that I need you to take away from this, and as usual, I am not going to read the comments until after I log off, but like the grief that perhaps is really holding you back, that is poisoning you. Like in this like tapping meditation, she said like, what color is it? What texture is it? What happens to you and to it when, if you're still holding on to it in 20 years and 40 years on your deathbed and like, I literally was like, I'll be dead. I think it will eat me alive. But what color is it? What's the texture of it? What is this cancer that is eating you from the inside out? Because you won't put down your expectations, your expectations of God, your expectations of life, your expectations of your family, your expectations that you change. 
And when you change them, you take the power back and you write your story. Because we serve a loving God. The universe does have your back. Life is working in your favor, even in the darkest moments we can trust it. Bury your expectations. Because it is only then that something new can grow. I really didn't think I was going to cry today. So thank you for being here. Um, please, if this resonated with you, please feel free to share. We will get it uploaded to our YouTube channel. I am less than 115 people away from the monetization limit. We still need quite a few watch limits or minutes. Um, my next 777 Happy Challenge launches on August 20th, at which point it will then not relaunch or be run or available until November because I'm launching my next challenge, which is The Happy Habit. The most content I have ever shared in one place. It literally will be, I think I have three of 12 videos left to film. The video content alone is worth over $1,300. And it's a dollar a day if you have the coupon code. $2 a day if you don't. So I would love, love, love to see any of you in those challenges. Because, well, they will change your life. And um, you need to start filling yourself up so that you can start implementing this work and stop just watching and listening and do it for yourself. So thank you for being here. Uh, make it a great day. Um, thank you.